The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We had the peace challenge last week. We had some failures. The peace challenge, the supernatural power of God. It's everywhere in your Bible and nobody talks about it. They think that's something where you just greet somebody. Oh, peace to you and peace to you. And they don't have any. It's the goal is to get you out of your comfort zone. And like one person said, I don't have a comfort zone. I just have various degrees of anxiety. All right. Well, in God, he himself is your peace. You are without excuse. He didn't go anywhere. You lose your peace, you went somewhere. He didn't leave. He doesn't leave you. He won't forsake you. You've got to walk away. When you lose your peace, you walk away. All right. Enough emotionalism for the women. Now for the men. Stress. Stress, I know this is going to really come as a shock to you. Stress is an emotion. Stress means you're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. Doesn't that get your goat? Well, good. Stop doing it then. When you're stressed, that means some person, place, or thing is, is controlling you. All right. Now we're going to receive a rather large offering. So, so Father... <laughs> If it's not enough, Pastor Vicki has to put it in. So, Father, we just bless the gift as well as the giver. We anoint this giving for the furtherance of the kingdom of God and for the expansion of the kingdom. And also, any special gifts you want to put in there, our studio, uh, the other building is almost done. Almost done. The studio at the other building is beautiful. It's almost done. We're not ready to videotape yet, but uh, eventually uh, it'll go on. It'll be on TV. Uh, we'll be doing it on Tuesday nights at our old building, limited seating. Uh, it's set up kind of like coffee house style. Um, what's the f- motif, Jennifer? What would you call that? It's kind of steampunk. Kind of steampunk. Whatever that is. How many even know what that is? Steam. It's kind of an industrial look. Gears and mason jars and uh, Edison lights and we getting we getting there now. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But <laughs> uh, we had a guy who's who did uh, uh, PTL and other television studios. He he set up the initial structure. We're doing the fine tuning. It's been five months, and we're still almost arriving at that place. So we'll be doing Tuesdays. Uh, They were going to televise these here, and we found out from producers that this building is too ugly. (laughs) If it's going to be on, yeah, I don't want to insult the building, but. I thought it was beautiful. uh, We thought it was nice when we came, but they said, "Mm -mm, gray, no color, mm -mm, don't, don't get it. So, anyway, our other building is very colorful, to say the least, right? Yeah, very colorful. So, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. By the way, what we're going to begin with today, actually, today's message is the full stature approach. That's the easiest way to describe what it is we do, because the emphasis is not on what's wrong. Our vision is not what's wrong. Our vision is grow up, maturity, full stature. And we said one of the most difficult things in the body of Christ is to transition from the pride of being independent and calling that mature to where real maturity is when you are healthy enough to be interdependent. Hmm? It's a sign when your kids are independent and they know everything. And then they get a little older and they come back and ask mom and dad questions. That is a good sign. 
They went from knowing everything to inquiring of someone that's got a few more years under their belt. That's maturing. That's a good thing. It becomes interdependent. All right. Now, <clears throat> uh, Jennifer and I were reading a magazine article recently. It really grieved me because really what we're pioneering or as Pastor Molly said, we're not even pioneering, we're, we're actually an original. Uh, the articles are trying to help people and it was like that we're dealing with trauma. I've seen every serious trauma dealt with in minutes and they're still propagating this get some expert to minister to you and if it doesn't work you keep coming back and I mean and that's I mean it's in a magazine it's like this is popular this is great and it just grieves my heart because the average person here that have been trained could minister more effectively than that and it's just that it's hard to get old school to think new because it's not a matter of education, it's re-education. Re-education is harder than education because you have to hear it enough times to where you're no longer thinking in the old terms. Um, <clears throat> our emphasis is already a major paradigm shift in that we're teaching believers to go to the simplicity that's in Jesus and the Jesus in them. You know what mindset would have to be broken? You've been all thoroughly convinced that somebody has to do something to you. Right? That's the way we were all trained in the church. Joe Heavy Speaker and somebody anointed in various giftings ministers to us. And yes, that's valid. But what we've created, though, in the process are people who never really learn how to deal with it when there's nobody around but them and Jesus, which is requiring you to stand on your own two feet. So we are in the process of structuring our house groups that I believe this is just a question of time. We've had some for a while, but uh, I know that this is a season of timing, and we're structuring these, these groups. And so I want to cover a little bit what we're going to, what it's going to look like. It's going to be the opposite of shallow. <laughs> Let's start with what it's not. All right? It's going to be the opposite of shallow. It's going to be groups that go deep. But when they go deep, the goal is maturity. The goal is intimacy. The goal is to be mature sons and daughters that are going to bring sons and daughters unto maturity. It's not what you get rid of. But unfortunately, we've been pigeonholed. We have been extremely proficient at teaching people. And that's not an overstatement, is it? Extremely proficient. That's not an overstatement at getting uh, people to get emotional healing quickly by going directly to God within not Joe Heavy Speaker doing it to you. Paradigm shift. However, because it's so effective, that's the part they see. That is not the goal. That's merely on the journey to maturity and full stature. You learn how to remove the obstacles that stand in the way. You learn how to overcome. You learn how to return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. Now, most of you that have been in prayer groups, whatever, you're all, you're all familiar with that scripture. And we shared it last week, and we're going to share it again. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and arguments and high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So there are arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And in the message, I like it because, matter of fact, we've used this, I think, in almost all of our modules, didn't we? because it breaks it down into plain, simple language. So this is not education this morning, this is re-education, because you're going to have to change your frame of reference from getting ministry from somebody to how to go and return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. When there's nobody around, you better know have your own relationship with God. You can't have mom and dad's relationship. You can't have somebody else's relationship. And you can't spend the rest of your life looking for someone who's paid the price and is anointed to, get, to minister relief to you. 
The age of the professional is dying away. Christian counseling is dying because God's going to return us back to a, a, a standing on our own two feet and then only occasionally need some of that other stuff. And thank God for some of that stuff. There'd be people who wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for some of that stuff. All right? So I'm not totally disregarding it, but I'm saying we've become overly dependent on it, that we could have learned how to work through these things on our own. So here's the first verse. After seeing that article, though, it just, it just grieved me that people were suffering traumas and they would go to the expert and the expert would, would uh, break stuff off of them and then the expert would do this and the expert, and if it didn't work because it was so bad, they would come back. And I'm sitting there thinking, I saw the Micmac Indian woman up in Nova Scotia deal with one, two, three, four, five serious traumas in less than 20 minutes. She was beat by a belt as a child that left scars from the buckle. She was sexually molested. She was raped. And she saw her son, I'm missing one, she saw her son murdered on the reservation. This is a Micmac Indian woman, uh, First Nations. And she saw her son murdered on the reservation and nobody did anything about it. And she sat there and she saw people getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, three abortions. Three abortions. And most people don't have that much, to tell you the truth. A lot of it was dealt with when you got saved. But yes, in that period of time, some people, we were in a house group of about 15 people and 15 pastors, a little overkill, talking about needing an expert. <laughs> Oh, by the way, this is interesting. Fifteen pastors traveling in the Maritimes, 15 people in a house group, 30 together. A couple got saved. A couple got filled with the Holy Spirit. And this Micmac Indian woman burst out having a meltdown. I, I want more too, but nobody understands what, I, what my life is like. Come on, some of you say that in your head, even if you don't have the outburst. Everybody's, nobody understands. My whole life. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a million times. Nobody understand my whole life. And actually, that's the ploy of the enemy to get you to think it's too big. Too big for Jesus. What an insult, all right? And she, oh, nobody. And so then 14, 13 out of the 15 pastors went like this to Jennifer and I. In other words, here's one for you guys. But everyone in here, most of, most of you could do it. Most of you, most of you are taking phone appointments from around the world, right? And we've got people that are phone counselors that, that, that are doing our ministry uh, in Virginia and uh, other places. Uh, but anyway, so she, I says, well, wait a minute. And I says, now this is in front of 30 people. One at a time, slow down, because first you got to cut through that. You don't understand there's so much. You don't understand what I've been through, you know, that kind. So you just say, wait a minute, just one at a time. What was the first one? I, I was beat as a child. And I could feel her spirit by discernment, which is a big plus. But it's not about my discernment. It's just that I could track. So I felt that, and the hurt was tremendous being built being beat by her father. And I says, right there where that hurt is, you let your Jesus, not me, not me going like that. That's what they want. I know, I know. I've been in church long enough. That's what you want. You want somebody else to do this, and you're done. The downside of that is it can work. The downside is it depends what that person's doing on the inside. It isn't about you, right? They have to cooperate, and they might not know how to cooperate. So you just tell them, that pain right there, you let the Jesus in you go to that pain. And right through that pain, you release forgiveness to your father. And as soon as I felt the change to peace, and I'm talking seconds, I said, there, that's it. She goes, you know what's going on inside of me. That built the confidence that it was her Jesus that did it. Yeah, I may have been able to track. Then the second one, the molestation. Releasing forgiveness, receiving forgiveness for the guilt and the shame, release forgiveness for the, for, the, for the molestation, releasing forgiveness. Less than 20 minutes, I'd say it was more like 10, probably within a 10-minute period, and this is in front of people, I say, I don't need to talk to you 
Most of you have been brainwashed into that's where you get relief, by talking. No, when you relief, you release dopamine, and you can get addicted to the talking it out. You can actually fortify it by talking about it enough. And she basically went through the molestations. She felt the peace. We went all the way through, and then having her son murdered. You see, here's where you've been brainwashed. You think big and little. Oh, but that's a big stuff. That's not like somebody cutting out in front of me in the road. The problem is, when we return to the simplicity that's in Jesus in you, big and little goes away. Big and little is in your head. Big and little is... Jesus said, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Hmm? It's all easy and it's all little. And she got... She, after the end of that, she stood up. Now here, here's some of you people are waiting to learn and learn and learn and learn before you help somebody. She went instantly, and we got reports back oh, a year later when we were on Sid Roth and told this story. The lady from the house group called and goes, that was my house where that happened. That was my house. And, and I says, how's the Micmac Indian woman doing? She's ministering on the reservation. How much training did she have? She had personal experience. Personal experience is better training than reading 35 books. If you don't have that internal awareness and transformation, and she said, at that meeting, I don't know, I don't know all about what's going on here, but I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go help my people. And she went back, and you know how you really learn this? Is you start working with people. You don't keep reading and reading and reading and reading and figuring it out. It's experiential. It's like being born again. You could talk about being born again until the cows come home, but until someone actually opens up and tries it, they're at a stalemate. Wasn't that exciting, that Mac Indian woman? And she's ministering to people. So where's all the training? You know what she learned? Is that the Jesus in me does the work. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But it's, it's in the area of the will, the least understood area I believe for Christians is the location of the will and the function of the will. When you, you fight by yielding, that's Christianity 101. You fight by yielding and you live by dying. Yes. All right, and I want to cover all of the techniques that I've seen in 42 years, all of them, that don't work. Don't do it and don't give in to it. All the goofy inner healing that I've seen over the years that is just a bunch of imagination and fairy tales. And it avoids the cross of Jesus Christ. If a method or a technique avoids the cross of Jesus and a real relationship with Him, get rid of it. So, here's the message, translation of the weapons of our warfare. We use our powerful God tools. This is not for leaders. This is a believer. We. Say, we means me. We use our powerful God tools. Oh, you mean you're supposed to do this? Oh, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers that have been erected against the truth of God. Now, here's the part I like. Fitting every loose, they're all loose, loose thought, loose emotion, and loose Loose impulse. That means mind, will, and emotions. That's loose. <laughs> Doing what it wants to do, when it wants to do it, and how it wants to do it. Well, it says, the weapons of our warfare, or these God tools, I have them in me, and they will fit all those loose thoughts, loose emotions, and loose impulses into a structure of a life that's being shaped by Jesus. So what does Jesus do on the inside of you? He takes those loose thoughts, those loose impulses, and those loose emotions and brings them. He doesn't annihilate them or cause them to cease to exist. He doesn't ask you to stuff or suppress. He says, I'm going to take them and over my lordship, I'm going to be the wind that blows into the sail of your mind, will, and emotions. I want your mind, will, and emotions, but I want it under the lordship of Jesus. And when you have peace, supernatural peace, peace rules, peace is ruling, then the mind, the will, and the emotions are being able to be used by God the way they were intended to be used by God. Usable. You become usable. And where did you get these God tools? It says, 
Our tools are ready and at hand. <laughs> well, you mean you got to call Joe Heavy Speaker? They're ready and at hand. On my cell phone. No. These tools are ready at hand in you when there's nobody around. It's you and Jesus. It's a return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. I am weary with all of the, all of the methods and models that are so cumbersome and time-consuming and heady. Do you know that this works with the... We've ministered to four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Most of your Christian ministry can't minister to a four or five-year-old because you've made it so complicated. It sounds like pop psychology. Huh? You've got these big 19-letter words. How are you going to effectively minister to a hurting child? How are you going to teach them for the Jesus in them? And yet, Jesus said, if we were all that simple, <laughs> this is the kind that I want to deal with. Someone that can humble themselves. Now, these tools are ready and at hand. They will remove every obstruction and they will build lives unto maturity. That's the full stature approach. It's maturity. But the emphasis is on maturity. The emphasis is on abiding. But we can't get Christians to learn to abide when they have impulses going this way and thoughts going this way and emotions having meltdowns, right? What do we want? We want to teach them how to go to the Jesus in them and bring those loose thoughts, those loose impulses. I always got a kick out of that when I learned, someone told me that all of those things at the checkout counter are for you impulsive people. It's real high markup items. They make big profit at the checkout counter. They put that for those people that you don't really need that, but it's, you're standing there in line, and it's right there saying, take me, take me, I need, I need, <laughs> I want, I want. And some of you, i got to have that. Do you really need that? No, but it's right here. <laughs> I've even been in the checkout in the grocery store where they have cupcakes and pastry right there for you. They're looking for the impulse. They're looking for the person without self-control. <laughs> no, okay, I'm messing with you now, but do you understand? Loose impulses, loose thoughts, loose emotions. The only way to properly deal with God, the fact that God made you a thinking, feeling, choosing being. He made us that way, but he says, I can cause it to operate at optimum if you can bring it under the peace of God, under the Lordship of God. When I say the peace of God, I'm talking about lordship, not Jesus my Savior, Jesus my Lord. Let the peace of God rule. Then we reign as kings in this life through Jesus. Okay? Now, what are these God tools? Well, the, the one that we traveled, and I, I think God had us travel for a number of years just to see what's out there, because I was shocked that the average Christian does not know how to forgive. Everybody in here knows how to do it. Because they were sincere... But they were saying things like, when I married Jennifer, um, the 60-day challenge, by the way, is named after Jennifer. For 60 days, she was a challenge. No, <laughs> for 60 days, she wanted challenge. She says, I saw you minister to someone that had a meltdown. Teach me that. She was already a Christian counselor. She was already Elijah House. She was already uh, so high on, in the secular psychology realm that she could be on the board of psychology in any state in the union, just by their test scores alone. And she said, I canned all of that for the Holy Spirit. I want what you had because you were getting results faster. See, didn't, she didn't want my brain. I was insulted because I, <laughs> I, I thought she should. But she was not impressed with my brain. She wanted to know how the Holy Spirit did this. Teach me. And she didn't say, do it to me. Teach me to do it. It's like surgeons. You know how surgeons are trained? You see one do one and then teach one. Wow. I hope I get a guy that's done more than one. <laughs> if I ever get surgery, I'm going to ask him, how many of times have you done this, right? Isn't that what we do? How many times have you done this, performed this? All right. But these God tools are forgiveness. And what we found... We can go down the list. Just go down the whole list of the God tools. You know, how, you, there's nobody in here that doesn't know how to forgive. If you can't do it in an instant, you don't know how to forgive. Forgiveness is instant. Now, maturity and restoration, that can take time. But forgiveness, and how do you know if you forgave properly? The peace. 
No peace, you didn't forgive. Not tough it out, forgive, and then God someday along the line will come and take it. I've heard every excuse in the world and all bad theology because a person can't do it right. If you can't do it right, don't change your theology to your bad experience. Change it to what should be taking place. All right, so forgiveness. What are the God tools? Forgiveness. The five functions of the human spirit. These are things that I learned in prayer when God took me to the school of prayer. How to, how to receive. You don't receive here. You receive here. You yield. You open the door of your heart. Your will is here, not here. You yield. You receive. Then I found out that when you forgive, you forgive from the heart. Matthew 18. Most people forgive from the head and struggle. And they're sincere. That makes it even worse. You can be sincerely struggling in your head and still do it wrong. You release from here. We're talking about people that have had deaths in the family and uh, divorce and grief. You cannot let it go. They say it at funerals. Father, into thy hands we commit their spirit. But if you don't do it from the heart, you'll stay in grief for a long time. Jesus takes your pain and your sorrow. He's the only one. Nobody can take your pain and sorrow except Jesus. He's the only one. And if you give it to him the grief from the heart, he'll take it away. It'll change to peace. I've had people that were so proficient at this when they lost the love of their life and they went through that grief and they released, and I know the stages of grief, but when they released it, they were apologizing to people because people thought that they shouldn't have peace, that they should be grieving. They've been indoctrinated to grieve for a long time. And you know, in some cases, people that lost a loved one, it was a long time illness. They had plenty of time to deal and release. So don't put no expectation on somebody that they're not crying hard enough for your benefit. Huh? It isn't about you. It's about them and teaching them how to get through their pain and their sorrow. And it's not easy, but, they, but it's easy for Jesus. It's just a question of learning how to drop down to your spirit and letting him do what you can't do and quit trying to do it. Most people prolong their pain by trying to do something that only God himself can do through you. And when it comes from the heart, it's, it's the recreated human spirit you. It's the real you. It's not your flesh you trying to do it without God. It's you and God together flowing out. You learn to release. You learn intercession has to flow from the heart. Loving intercession. The way to learn real loving intercession is not what you say, but what, what's it connected to. If it's flowing right, loving intercession is a God tool. And the way I learned that love had to flow out of my belly, not just my mind thinking nice thoughts, is that when I forgave somebody properly, I noticed that after I forgave them, there was still a flow of openness toward that person. I went, my goodness, after you forgive and remove the pain and the barrier that you had with that person, what's flowing out is really nice. Oh, that's the love of God. That's the way we should be interceding for people. That's the kind of flow and openness that should be flowing out of us. But first, forgiveness removes the barrier. But what about after the barrier? Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. There's a flow afterwards. Then there's also learning to resist. And um, as, as one of the loving functions, we're not going to be able to cover all this. I'm not even past the first paragraph. All right, just I'm going to read the list, and I'm not going to teach you how to do it. Oh, let me tell them to resist. I'm going to tell them to resist first, and then I'm going to read the rest of the list. Because this is a mistake. I see it everywhere. If you as a believer walk into the grocery store and you see somebody that you had ought against, I'll guarantee you, I don't care how spirit-filled you are, how gifted you are, the first thing you do down here is go, uh-oh, uh-oh, there's, you know what that is? You think you're protecting yourself from that person? You just close the door of your heart to that person. You're saying, I might be forced to listen to them, but I am not, my heart is not open to them. But you know what? In your, in your self-preservation mentality, you know what you also did? You cut Jesus out and said, I'm not bringing you into this scenario. I'm going to handle this myself. You shut the door of your heart, you close your will. That door, 
The door only does open or close. <laughs> There's no halfway. I used to get Christians that used to tell me, I'm trying to pray through, but I'm stuck. Oh, nah, 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 nah. Jesus doesn't get, get halfway through a wall <laughs> and go, <"Ugh!" laughs> All right? He doesn't get stuck. You get stuck. Stuck means part of me wants to and part of me really don't want to do this. <laughs> that person is mean. I, I know I'm supposed to, but I don't know if I want to. That's stuck. Agree with the part that wants to, and you'll get unstuck instantly. Agree with God, in other words. Agree with His Word. Agree with what He would say, and you get unstuck instantly. So don't ever come to me and say you're stuck. I find that too amusing. There's no such thing as stuck. You got, I picture Jesus halfway through. <laughs> Don't do that to Jesus. <laughs> Prayer. The fruit of the Spirit is the armor. The fruit of the Spirit is armor that the only legitimate wall that you should have between you and even an enemy is peace. Because scripturally, that peace is supernatural. It'll guard your heart and your mind. If somebody lays into you with all kinds of profanities and you keep your peace, it cannot penetrate. You will not get slimed and you will not lose sleep over it. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. It's just that most people are afraid to trust God. They'd rather put up the wall and trust themselves. But that's not safe. You put up a wall with somebody, you're on your own. And if they're demonic, it's going to go right through that. You're going to get slimed and all beat up and bent out of shape. And I mean, we went everywhere and people did it wrong. Everywhere. Some of the best taught churches. So what are the God tools? Forgiveness the five loving functions, the fruit of the Spirit, prayer, the Bible, your authority, the believer's authority under the Lordship of Jesus, discernment, and basically the patterns and principles of God. Thank you, sweetie. And this blue card is, to me, utterly... I mean, we did, taught courses on this, and I can still remember. I said, this is the blue card, one lady. What do you mean by blue? <laughs> okay, so sometimes we had to go slow in these courses, all right? But on the other hand, prayer, first person or situation. This is for you to do by yourself. You could do this with this card. First person or situation, feel the feeling, forgive. Forgive when you feel anything other than the peace of God. That's a feeling, men. And if you feel nothing, let Jesus go through that nothing until you get peace. And men, let Jesus go through that good. Good is usually joy for a man. All right? But they don't call it joy. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay, well, through good. See, we men have one Crayola that's negative, and we call that frustration. And that could be anything from lust, hurt, guilt, shame, fear, anger, frustrated. So we have that one Crayola, but by golly, Jesus can get through that frustration, no matter what you call it. All right? Yuck. I've seen him work miracles. And people who said, when I think of so-and-so, I feel yuck. Let Jesus go to that yuck and through that yuck until it changes to peace. This blue card was handed to a man in one of our long explaining seminars. Three-day seminar. Three seminar explaining how to do this stuff. A man came in from Maine. Not you, Brad. A man came in from, from Maine, sat down next to his wife, knew nothing and we broke into groups using the blue card, and he went to his wife, close your eyes. Focus on the first 
person or situation that comes to mind. Allow yourself to feel the feeling. Let Jesus, the forgiver who lives within, allow a river of forgiveness to flow through that negative emotion until it changes to peace. He looked up and his wife was sobbing, getting all kinds of quality ministry. He went, wow, what did I do? And I said, that's the point. It wasn't really about you. <laughs> If we could get more leaders to realize it really isn't about you, that it's Jesus doing the work, for it is God. What a, what a, what, we need an epiphany on this. It is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. Ah, uh, I thought I was the performer. No. Jesus didn't want actors. <laughs> he wanted Vessels that he could work through and get out of the way. This blue card is a God tool, trust me, because it gives very simple, you could do this with a child and get results. This is part and parcel of the house groups. They will not stay shallow because we're, we're looking to do two things. One, we want to mature the body of Christ to bring many sons unto glory and bring into, into the place of maturity. But they have to learn the basics of how to deal with their issues and how to die to an agenda. An agenda is me and my ministry and what I want to do. And more often than not, if it's not working well, it's because it needed to be done in conjunction with other people. It's very common. You know, my spiritual father used to tell me, Dennis, you know, the problem with people is the average believer, know if they're ahead, they don't think they're a foot. It's pretty, if they're a hand, they're not a foot. He said, the ones that run into problem are the ones that they might be teeth instead of lips, or they might be tongue. It's close enough that they could spend many years confused as to what, what they're to do because there's a distinction that needs to be made and they need to find how to pair up properly. And that resolves sometimes years of struggle. But we have to break free of that independent my ministry for that to, to, for that to function properly. All of the how-tos are God tools. All of the how-tos. Everything that we teach helps. That blue card, you deal with toxic emotions, mental strongholds, and unmet emotional needs. All that I needed and didn't receive growing up. I've, I see adults in their 50s and 60s struggling with stuff that, quite frankly, could have been dealt with quickly had they released the demands and expectations on getting it from somebody. God could have ministered to them directly. Um, simply going to I fear lest this is 2 Corinthians 11.3 I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Jesus we, we can make it complicated can't we hmm? the guidelines for the full stature approach utilizes prayer coaching, not counseling. What would be the difference between a coach, a prayer coach and a prayer counselor? The counselor, you're expecting them to do something, give you advice. The coach is basically saying, you can do this. I'll help you show you how. You and Jesus can do this. That's a paradigm shift, though. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't like that. I can remember an altar call I did once where a woman came up, same one that asked about the blue card. What do you mean by blue? When I says, okay, put your hand down here. And I says, where it hurts, we're going to let, let Jesus in you. I came up here for you to pray for me. <laughs> See? That's the mindset. And that's actually what we have to break free from. The key, 
for prayer coaching is talk as little as possible. That Micmac Indian woman, just minimal information so that I knew whether she needed to forgive herself or somebody else. Just that much information. You've been taught to talk about it forever, right? Hmm? That has to be unlearned. Well, the only time I've seen prayer coaching difficult is when the person insists that you know the whole story because somehow they've learned that that makes them momentarily feel better because it's a release. It, it decompresses, but guess what? It fortifies the need to do that. Can you understand that part? It fortifies the need to do that. You talk about something long enough, you might feel momentarily like you're releasing it, but in reality, you're fortifying. It's the old punch a pillow when you get angry. You're actually, in the long run, going to fortify your anger. You're practicing. You're not releasing. Momentarily, it feels good. Kick that lawnmower until it repents. But we want to see people learn how to use their own God tools. But before we teach you how to do it, and this is going to be part and parcel in a house group. You've got to build relationship. But here's what we're doing. Accountability is why John Wesley turned England upside down. Because he says people are either going forward or backward. They're not, there's nobody standing still. And the ones that went forward were the ones that were accountable during the week. And that's why we're emphasizing house groups. If you're accountable, that doesn't mean you've got to tell everybody and just fling open your life to everybody, but you at least need to be honest that I had a good week or a bad week and it, get someone to teach you how to, how to deal with it yourself. Give you the God tools. Teach you how to equip you to do the work of the ministry that you need to do. <clears throat> Take the role of a facilitator and that well, let's cover what not to do. You can learn what to do, but here's some of the things that would probably have to be avoided. Uh, do not use visualization. I've seen visualization is quite functional in the prophetic, but it's basically foretelling, you're decreeing and declaring what you see. But if a person is going to receive ministry, you don't say picture a door Picture Jesus holding you, because what you, what you, the damage that that does, it sounds really nice, but those old-fashioned methods do something. Every thought, and science knows this now, every thought, every impulse is controlled by the emotions. Every thought has a corresponding emotion attached to it. I don't care if it's... You think of cottage cheese, maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, but it's got a feeling attached to it, a like or a dislike of some kind. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. For years, people were calling this ministry. Okay, so I like that Micmac Indian woman. Instead of facing the fact I saw my son murdered on the reservation in front of my eyes, feel the trauma and let Jesus take the trauma. Instead, they would say, Okay, picture your son on the reservation, but picture Jesus was there, and Jesus was, was holding him. And Jesus, what you just did was you minimized the trauma with imagination, and every thought has a corresponding feeling. Now the trauma feels like it went away because you're picturing Jesus. And the more you think about Jesus, the better the feeling gets. That is not ministry. That's changing the subject. And you know where you learn that from? All of your Bible preachers who taught you, are you struggling with a lustful thought? Go to the Word. Doesn't that sound like a good answer? But you know what you're teaching them? You're struggling with a lustful thought? Go read your Bible. You didn't deal with a lustful thought. You change the subject. How long is that going to last? All of those methods avoid 
facing the fear and dealing with it through a work of the cross that Jesus himself is more than willing to do through forgiveness and repentance. You face what actually happened. You get that feeling. If you start changing what actually happened, oh, I've even seen them in, in, uh, uh, in some of those recovery groups. Uh, oh, all that blood that was in the accident, that's not blood. Picture that as ketchup. Picture that as jello. You're changing it to minimize the effect, but that is not transformation. That's changing the subject. And quite frankly, it's a lie. To get specific. Those are archaic, old-fashioned methods, but when people are sincerely trying to help people, they'll try whatever they can try in order to help people. But you've got Jesus and you've got the simplicity of Him in you as the God tool. Learn how to face your pain until it changes to peace. That's resolution. Hmm? That's a testimony. Yeah. That's a, uh, here's what a testimony is. And by the way, with discernment, I had a hard time being an advisor for a women's group that were giving testimonies. You know why? Because by discernment, they were testifying to something they coped with. They did not get healed of it. Unsaved people can cope. As a matter of fact, that's what it teaches you, right? Mm -hmm. Jennifer's definition of psychology, and she was a psychologist, was how to more effectively resist the Holy Spirit through willpower. <laughs> and cope. Mm -hmm. So... When you release and let God do it and it changes to peace, there was a supernatural transaction. You didn't change the subject. Then you have a testimony. And you could say, I used to be wiped out on heroin and, I, and have peace while you're talking about it. That's a testimony. Not, I used to be on heroin. <laughs> I mean, I went to AA meetings where, where the guy was telling me how he was free. And he was, he, was, he was smoking a cigarette and shaking. I just want to testify. And I'm going, that's, from a Christian point of view, that's not a testimony. That's coping. I haven't had a drink in three weeks. It sounds terrible, but I was almost like, take a drink. Well, maybe a little one. I don't know. No, 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 no. But the pain and the suffering grieve me because there's a solution in Jesus and they're teaching coping. And thank God for it. Maybe they wouldn't survive without coping. I'm glad some people have coped in hard places. But don't call coping a healing. Don't call coping a testimony. A testimony is when you can talk about it with peace in your heart. If you can't talk about it with peace in your heart, it's not done yet. It's potential. Potential means you haven't done it yet. <laughs> So nobody in any of our house groups will ever do visualization and change history to make it feel better. No picturing Jesus in there. No watering down the event. I want a real person. And uh, for the prophetic people, you have to deal with it. They go, okay, who's the first person or situation? They'll go, uh, Puff the Magic Dragon. And I'm, <laughs> I want a real person and a real situation. I don't want spooky spiritual stuff here. All right, it's my mother. And I'm smoking to get even with her. I'm standing behind a high school and I'm smoking to get even with her. Oh, they've puffed the magic dragon, all right. But we need a real person. We can't get puff, we can't get puff saved. We can't get him to repent. Sometimes you're too spiritually out there when it's really quite simple. When you're ministering to somebody, you don't use the pictures. This is not a time to prophesy to them. That is the biggest mistake you can possibly make. Because you just told them that the Jesus in them can do it, and then you're over there giving them a prophetic word. You hurt them doing that. 
on the one hand you're saying, Jesus in you can do this, but then on the other hand, here's what I see. And blah, 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 blah. Or I guided imagery. There was counselors, there was secular counselors that got sued for that kind of stuff. Guided imagery is when they, okay, picture Jesus holding you as a little girl, and he's doing such and such, and, and see Jesus picking him up. Oh, Jesus is hugging you now, the little girl. Don't you feel better now? That's not the way you deal with pain. You deal with the real person and the real situation, and you bring it to death on the cross. You don't try to find some Band-Aid that makes you feel better momentarily. I've seen this in altar calls. There, there's name leaders that have done this, and they'll say, how many women have ever been abused in this audience? How many are, and, and there's an anointing on it because there was a need, and they had a legitimate word. You can have a legitimate word and bad application, can't you? Right? Legitimate word. People are crying, come forward to the altar. Come forward to the altar. Now, what was it? They were molested. Okay, now that you're at the altar, lift up your hands and let's worship Jesus. Let's everybody lift up their hands and worship Jesus. What you just did was change the subject. And they're going to feel every thought has a corresponding emotion. When you start worshiping Jesus, what's the emotion going to be? Pleasant. Oh, I must have gotten healed. Think about the molestation and the ugly feeling comes back, it has to be brought to the cross. You just change the subject. We're a clever bunch, we're not, and nobody's intentionally doing that. But they believe that that's ministry because it changed. No, you just changed the subject. You've got to deal with the problem head on, deal with it until the pain goes. Jesus is the only one that can take that pain and that sorrow, not by changing the subject. And then there's the other thing where you could fill out paperwork forever. I tried that once to where I did case histories, filled out paperwork for hours and hours and hours, sat down with the person and bam, bam, they got healed of being raped in Puerto Rico like that, boom, boom, and there was nothing on the paperwork about that. <laughs> so I said, I'm not doing this paperwork stuff no more. I don't need it. I would rather the Holy Spirit pick the cherries. Let him pick in a sequence. He knit me together in my mother's womb. He is the only one smart enough to pick the sequence. Amen. And if a surgeon's going to operate and do open heart surgery, don't you want him to do the proper sequence? Amen. I don't want him going in through my nose. I know that's right? right? <laughs> I want him to use the proper sequence. I break that off of you. It's very common in all of our charismatic circles. I break that off you. Unfortunately, if the person doesn't know, you could have the authority to break something off, but in the, if that person doesn't know how to cooperate with that, nothing happens. Because it requires their will. Deliverance requires their will. Failure in deliverance, it's a will problem. There has to be a want to, and there has to be a no-so how to function from the Spirit and not just agree mentally. Prayer agreement is not mental assent. Prayer in agreement is spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. There's a, there's a, a union that is taking place spiritually, and it's discernible. Now... The other one is prophetic pictures, prophecy, revelations. When a person, when we're ministering to somebody and they get the prophetic pictures, we say, let's just put that on a shelf for now. I want a real person in a real situation because that's where the pain came from. I don't need a way to water it down by association. You've got to forgive somebody. You need to know who that person is. You don't need an eagle or symbolism that's my mother-in-law because the eagle means, oh, oh. <laughs> just deal with your mother-in-law. Forgive her! 
Don't get spooky spiritual on us. I don't need... I never forgot that, though. Puff the magic dragon. I was thinking, actually, it was accurate. She didn't want to admit her anger toward her mother. She was Puff the magic dragon. 16 years old, smoking behind the school because she was mad at her mother, and that was one way to get even in her mind. And the funny thing is, is do you know that when she released forgiveness to her mother, it took seconds once I got put Puff on a shelf. So we're not going to deal with Puff the Magic Dragon. I want the first real person. My mother. I'm smoking. I hate her. <laughs> we released forgiveness to her mother. She was instantly delivered of three packs a day cigarettes. So forgiveness is powerful. There can be physical manifestation that goes along with it. How many of you are afraid of our house groups now? <laughs> it's, all, it's not for the faint at heart. No, basically, yes, you will learn how to deal with stuff and how to, how to maintain your Christian life, but there's something that accountability does. It keeps you from backsliding. By accountability, I mean, how was your walk this week? Did you struggle? How'd you do with the peace challenge? Hmm? Did you create the atmosphere that was conducive or were you affected by other people's atmosphere? Did peace rule and triumph and crush the negative atmosphere or did you succumb to the atmosphere? I remember the five points from last week. One, just how do you do in general with the will of God and stayed in peace? Did you make any decisions from the place of peace or the place of frustration. If you make it from the place of peace, that's a good decision. It'll be good timing. Be God honored. The third one, atmosphere in the house, at work. When you walked in the door, they went, oh, he's home. Did you bring that kind of thing in the house? Or he's home. Which one of those did you bring into the house? Terry? Oh, did I say that? <laughs> what kind of atmosphere did you bring in the house? Thirdly, in a difficult situation or an uncomfortable situation, did peace guard your heart or did you put up the wall? How many were in uncomfortable situations this week? <laughs> did you put up a wall? Probably most of you did. Learn how to go, Jesus, here comes so-and-so. Oh, it's a little scary, but if you keep your peace, anything they say or do cannot penetrate. The enemy cannot touch the fruit of the Spirit. He cannot penetrate. It's the only true wall that we should have between our friends and friends and enemies is that peace because then love can flow out. Anointing can flow out. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world needs peace or that's not that's theory and not factual. When you're at peace, greater is he that's in you is actually you're actually walking that out. Because he impacts the environment greater than the environment can impact you when you're at peace. The scripture is loaded with peace and everybody thinks it's some kind of passive thing. No, that God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. And I'm going to close with this one. Uh, we did this on Sid Roth and it's in our books, but it's, it's worth mentioning again and again because it re-educates toward peace. Peace is not passive. And I worked in a halfway house of guys that got out of prison. Most of you heard that story. And there was a guy that was going to make a break for it. He didn't take his medication, grabbed the knife. I'm standing by the only exit. And the peace increased. Now, normally I'd say if somebody pulls a knife, get out of the way, call the police. But in this case, the peace was so significant that I knew that I was not going to move. And when I decided not to move, the peace increased even more. And he held that knife out, and, which seemed like a long time, until his hands started to shake, and he dropped the knife, and he dropped to his knees. And they gave him his medication that he didn't take. Uh, but the 
God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. That's not some kind of theory. That peace is the most formidable force on planet Earth, and He Himself is your peace, and He never left you. You can go away from it and take matters into your own hands. You have to learn to practice, practice, practice letting the peace of God rule in all arenas of life. And I'll tell you what, I taught it to my nurses in my first church, ER nurses, uh, intensive care unit nurses, and they learned that they operated more efficiently by staying in peace even in the emergency room compared to the way they learned to, I can't get attached to these people so I stuff it and then go home and decompress for two and a half hours where I don't want to talk to nobody, don't talk to me, I don't want to answer the phone, I don't want to say, I want to, because I have to decompress from stuffing. What gets suppressed will get expressed later. What if you could bring those emotions under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And Jennifer says, by the way, while you are suppressing them and getting stressed, because it takes, it's like holding a rubber ball under water, it takes effort to do that all day. While you're doing that, you drop 20 points in your IQ. I can't afford it. Maybe you can. I can't, I can't afford 20 points. So, accomplish more with less effort would be to learn to walk in that peace. You agree? Are we going to practice for next week too? Those five areas of peace. If you don't know, get our book on the supernatural power of peace. Yeah. Is there anybody that had a major trauma recently? Anybody? From, you're not sure if you ever dealt with it? Come on up right now. Let me demonstrate for the benefit of other people. Come on. That's it, Paul. If they don't answer, just come on up. particular trauma and now in a corporate setting like this you don't even have to say what it is that's how effective God is okay. just enough it was you think of the trauma nod your head put your hand right down here Ooh. face it allow yourself to feel even momentarily just a little bit of the fear there you go right there now relax let Jesus in you go to it and through it, but keep picturing it here. Don't picture Jesus. Don't picture rivers. Just picture the trauma. Mm -hmm. You face it mm -hmm. and let peace flow. And I think she did it before I was done talking. Mm -hmm. Now, the scripture says test the spirit. I mean, test your own spirit first. Picture the trauma. And I can tell by discernment she's okay. You're picturing the trauma? Mm -hmm. You did good. Mm -hmm. That, and here's what's neat. When it's a supernatural exchange and when God puts peace, He don't play charismatic Pentecostal prophetic games. If He puts peace on it, you own that the rest of your life. Ten years from now, you picture that trauma, mm -hmm. there's peace. You have a testimony now. Mm -hmm. Gee, we didn't, maybe we should sit down and talk for about three hours about the trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. This is not staged. I've even had people say that had to be staged because it never could be that fast. That's because the way you do it takes so long. <laughs> Did you know Christians are known for that? Did you know that until Martin Luther came, that for, for, for hundreds of years they lost the fact of the born-again experience and they were basically trying to earn it? Don't tell me Christians don't know how to make it hard. Turn of the century, 1900, Pentecost. People began speaking in tongues. And there were some in Pentecostal churches who were tearing because the Bible said, tarry in Jerusalem, and they were tearing for 14 to 18 years. And these crazy charismatics come along and they go, no, just do it. No, just receive it right now. <laughs> well, after waiting 16 years, that's a bit insulting, isn't it? I'm waiting for God to do something. 
Do we, can we make it hard? Yeah. But it's all simple for Jesus. Is it easier for me to say, take up your bed and walk, or your sins are forgiven? On our end, we make stuff big and little. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.